Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Philippians chapter 1, the book of Philippians and chapter 1, please. We're going to verses 3 through 7, Philippians 1, verses 3 through 7. We'll read the verses responsibly, as we normally do, beginning together on verse 3, then I'll read 4, we alternate like that, until we end together on verse 7 of Philippians chapter 1. As our custom is, let's stand together, all of us standing to read God's Word. Let's begin together on verse 3 of Philippians chapter 1. Ready? I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, Ye all are partakers of my grace. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight. And Lord, we're thankful for the wonderful music this evening and for the good singing by the people of God. And Lord, it's just been good to be in church tonight. Thank you for the good spirit that's here this evening. And we're asking you, Lord, to bless the special as it's sung now and that it will again put our hearts in tune with your heart. And you'll make us prepared and ready to hear what the Spirit would say to us through your word this evening. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Long ago I saw my Savior bearing shame up on a tree. Then my heart was touched with sorrow, for I saw he bled for me. Yet as fan as loud he cried, oh what love for me he died. In my stead he bled on Calvary once for all, Christ rescued me. Lo, the sky was veiled in darkness, sudden trembling shook the ground. As the angry crowd was jeering, mocking Jesus all around. Then my Savior called to heaven, as I saw his love anew. Oh, my Father, please forgive them, for they know not what they do. It has been as loud, he cried, no what love for me he died. In my stead he bled on Calvary, once for all Christ rescued me. Free salvation now he offers. Take his gift, oh, hear his plea. On the bloody cross, behold him. Join his shout of victory. It has finished, loud he cried. Oh, what love for me he died. In my stead, he bled on Calvary. Once for all, Christ rescued me. Amen, Bob. It's good. Now, Father, we thank you for this evening and for the opportunity we have to open up your word and look at it together. Lord, I pray that each of us would give our attention to your word tonight. Lord, we're thankful that we have the Bible this evening. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring your word and preserving it for us, that we hold copies in our hand tonight. We don't believe it's just the words of man or the words of men. We believe it to be in truth, the very words of God. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would listen carefully 
And I ask your spirit to minister to our hearts tonight and help us to be the kind of people that the church cannot do without. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> I told you I was going to speak tonight on the subject the people the church cannot do without. And I'm glad you came to find out if you're one of them. Uh, Paul organized many churches, as you know. He was uh, a great church planter. Many of the epistles of the New Testament are letters to churches uh, that he helped to establish. The church at Corinth and the church at Ephesus and the church in Colossae and the church at Thessalonica. Here, the church at Philippi. Now, some of these churches were a great joy to him and some were not such a great joy to him. Uh, he had to d deal with different problems and uh, he had put everything he had into establishing these Christians, these believers, into uh, what we would call a church, a called out assembly of believers. And some of the churches were very pleasing to him and some, I'm sure, he had some disappointment in. And uh, I, we would understand that. I don't know that Paul would ever say he had a favorite church, but I think one of his favorites would have been the church at Philippi. Uh, this is a wonderful little epistle that he wrote. Four chapters. The theme of the whole book is joy. Uh, and he took great joy in the believers at Philippi. And remember, uh, it was kind of a rough start there. If you remember back in the book of Acts when he went to Philippi, he thought it was going to go real good because he had a vision of the man from Macedonia and saying, come help us. Uh, and you know, when he got into Philippi, the chief city of Macedonia, he couldn't find any men. And they said, well, there's some women down by the river there doing some uh, rituals and such. You can go down and talk to them. And of course he did. And Lydia got saved and her household got saved. Uh, it wasn't long after that, though, that they got thrown into slammer. Uh, and they got put in prison. And they were beaten and put in prison. And that's when at midnight they were praying and singing praises to God. And God sent the earthquake. And remember, the, everybody's bands fell off, but all the prisoners stayed put. Imagine that. Imagine if, if a power outage went out and all the, all the gates flew open at the prison and uh, everybody just stayed put. Uh, that just wouldn't happen. But they did. And the jailer came in and the jailer got saved that night and the uh, jailer's wife got saved and all the little jailer kids got saved. And uh, they got baptized and God started a church in Philippi. And so he loved this church at Philippi and we'll, we'll take some different passages here as we go through it and understood how, what, what a dear place in his heart that these people and the, these folks in Philippi had. And I, I, I think there's at least some of these people in every church. And I know we have some of these people in our church. But I would like to have more of all these people in our church and in every church. And so let's see what, what it is, uh, the, peop the kind of people that a church cannot get along without them. Just who are they? Well, number one, it's faithful people. The church cannot do without faithful people. Look with me at Matthew chapter 21. Would you turn there, please? Matthew chapter 21. Jesus gives a teaching here, and he gives a parable in Matthew chapter 21. And I think I have the wrong, hold on, I'm not where I want to be. Let's see, I think, hold on, don't go anywhere. I'll find it. How about Matthew 25? Let's go there. I've got dyslexic. Matthew 25 instead of Matthew 21. You know the story, the Lord gave the parable of the talents here, or the, he, he Verse number 14 says, The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And, he gave, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. And you know the story. The one who got five talents went and traded and got five more and ended up with ten. The one who got two went out and traded. He got two more. He had four. But the one who got the one, what did he do with his? Yeah, he went and buried it in the earth. And of course, the, the master comes back after a long time. Verse 19, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. 
And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he repeats the same thing to the fellow who had two and got two more. Verse 23 says, As the Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. They are not commended for their brilliance. They are not commended uh, for their intellect. They are not com they're commended uh, just for their greatness. They are commended for their faithfulness. Well done, thou good and faithful servant servant what God is looking for is just faithfulness you know uh, Cal Ripken broke uh, Lou Gehrig's record for most consecutive games played as a baseball player Lou Gehrig had held the record for years most most people only know his name now because it's a disease named after him they end up taking his life but in 1927, he was named the Outstanding Baseball Player of the Year. And at that point in time and up until Cal Ripken broke his record, he had played more consecutive games than any other man in the history of the sport. In fact, the, the fellow, he was, he was a backup first baseman, and the fellow was either sick that day, the regular first baseman, or he was injured, and Lou Gehrig took over. And for the next uh, 1,000 and some games... He never missed a game. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me, the guys today that got to have a day off here and there and things like that, but you're playing a game, you know? But there he is. Never, he was called the Iron Man of Baseball. The Iron Man of Baseball. Because he was always there. Never miss. Now that's for a baseball game. You say, well, Pastor, I'm on the team. Well, how many games do you miss? How you be on the team if it can't depend on you to be at the games? You see, faithfulness. Late in his career when the Yankees were comfortably ahead in the pennant race, Joe DiMaggio, who was a great baseball player for the Yankees at that time, was asked, why do you continue to play so hard? You've already clinched the pennant. And Joe DiMaggio said this, because there might be somebody out there who's never seen me play. And I want them to see me play my best. Could you know that every Christian ought to live every day as if... Cause, listen, because somebody's going to see you as a Christian for the first time. And their whole idea of Christianity is going to be formed because of what they see in you. You're the best Christian that somebody knows. Will they see faithfulness in your life? I like the story W.B. Riley tells about a man who walked the streets of Philadelphia searching for employment. One day he happened to go in the office of a well-known businessman by the name of Gerard. How about that? I didn't think about that until just now. Certainly a distant relative. <laughs> Real distant, yeah. But uh, he's, he asked for a job, and Mr. Gerard said, yeah, I can give you some work. See that pile of bricks out there? Carry them over to the other side of the yard and stack them up. By nightfall, the man came back and reported the project completed and received his pay. When he asked, will there be more work tomorrow, his employer said, yes, come in tomorrow and carry those same bricks back to where you found them. The following morning, he came in early, got busy without a word. For more than a week, he was instructed to carry the bricks back and forth until it was evident that he could be trusted to do exactly as he was told. Then he was given a new and bigger responsibility. Go downtown and bid on a large quantity of sugar. Not recognizing him, the people at the auction were surprised by the bid of this total stranger. When it was accepted, the auctioneer asked who would pay the bill. He said, Mr. Gerard, I am his agent. He had earned the position by being faithful in a menial task. Jesus put it this way, He that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful also in that which is much. Whenever God is looking for someone to use and someone who He'd like to put His hand upon, He's looking for someone who will be faithful. 
And that's what God requires of you and me, is faithfulness. If, if Christ were to pick out the best Christian in the room, I'll guarantee you he'd have to start with people who are faithful. People who are faithful. Faithful, dependable. Faithful, you can count on it. Faithful, sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, I'll be faithful. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Jesus said in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The church's great need, listen, is not just more Christians and not just more bodies. The, the church's great need is more faithful Christians. People who say, I want to be faithful unto death. I want to be reliable. I want to be dependable. That's what we're looking for. That's what God's looking for. People who be faithful in their giving and faithful in attendance and faithful to live the Christian life every day of the week, not just Sunday, not just Wednesday. Faithful in serving, faithful in witnessing. The church won't get along without faithful people. It's an absolute necessity. Faithfulness. Number two, the church also cannot do without willing people. Look at the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, would you please? Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. It's really a, it's a sad verse, but it's an important verse. God is, telling, is speaking through Ezekiel about His judgment that's going to come upon Israel. He says in verse 29 of Ezekiel 22, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And then God said in verse 30, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. God said, I looked for a man that would make up the heads, that would stand in the gap, that I wouldn't have to judge this land. Was the problem there were no men? No, there were men. There were no willing men. Nobody willing to stand in the gap. Nobody willing to stand up for Christ. You say, oh, preacher, we got, uh, we got willing people in the church. Some are willing to work and others are willing to let them work. Sometimes that's the willingness. You know, it's sad when we have church members that are willing to do the work of the world, but not the work of the Lord. Oh, the job calls them and they go. They go. The club calls or some outside organization calls and they're ready and willing to go. But the Lord calls. The church calls and, well, I'm just busy. Boy, it's quiet in here, isn't it? Hmm? man said to me one time, well, I don't come to church on Sunday nights because that's the only time I have for my family. But when you upon further investigation you find out the other nights of the week were taken up with his own personal pleasures and hobbies and social life and interests and pleasures and so he decides he'll take the lord's day and give part of that to his family Can i tell you what the best family time is his family time would be coming to church on sunday night there's nothing wrong with that Christians ought to be willing to serve the Lord. Willing to make adjustments in their life in order to put God first. God says, I'm to be first. And listen, that is being willing to serve the Lord. God, God can, uh, listen, God has ways to make us willing, but He sure would like us to be willing. Somebody says, well, I, God did this to me, or God did that to me, or God beat me up, and so I finally had to surrender. But you know, God will take a volunteer. Isaiah said, here, my Lord, send me. And God said, okay, I will. 
And so you can take, uh, you can be willing to serve God. Someone said there's two groups in the church, the willing and the whining. Which group are you in? You can, you can complain about what needs improving or what needs to be done. Or you can say, what can I do to help improve this? How can I help? What can I do? The grasshopper on the fence makes more noise than the ox in the field, but the ox is doing the work. Some people talk a lot, but they're not doing anything for God. I told you before, I think that uh, it sure is easy to uh, sit on the sideline or, or to, to sit in your living room and watch the game on television and uh, tell that quarterback everything he's doing wrong. But you've never taken a, got under the center and taken a hike in all your life. So it's hard to, hard to criticize that guy when you've never done anything. You've never coached a game or played in the game, but I sure know how he ought to do it. And there's a lot of Christians like that. Don't be one of those kind of Christians. Be willing. People who really love the Lord, people who are willing to serve Him say, Pastor, let me serve wherever you believe God wants me to be. I'll serve wherever you want me to be, whatever I, wherever I'm needed. I'm willing to work anywhere that I can glorify God, serve His cause. Obviously, we'll try to put you where we think you're, you're gifted, and every, everybody has gifts, you understand that. We're, we're part, the, the Bible says that we're part of the church, which is Christ's body. So you remember, that's why Paul told the church of Corinth, you know, the, the hand can't say I don't need the foot, or the eye can't, you know, every part is important. Okay? We're all, we're all as members, we make up a body. Okay? And, and listen, so when you think, well, oh, you know, if I don't make it tonight, it's okay. Yeah, but we're missing some fingers. We're missing part of the foot. Whatever part of the body you are, we're missing that. And listen, yes, the church can get along. You, you, when, when you hurt an arm, like Pricey over here, okay, well, she's getting along, but I'll tell you what, she's looking forward when that arm is healed and she can use both arms again. You ever broken an arm or had something incapacitated like that? Yeah, you'd used, get used to doing everything left-handed. When you're right-handed, that's, that's difficult. But you do it to get by, but that's not how you want to live. You say, well, why, why sometimes the church just limp along and the church just doesn't seem to, to go and get going like it ought to? Because there's too many parts of the body missing. That she's just crippled to get done what she ought to get done. And it's just willingness. Just willing to serve. Willing to be faithful. Christianity is never a spectator religion. It's a participation religion. It's to do something for God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. To hear well done, you've got to do something. You have to be involved. Be willing to work. The best ability is availability. God, I'm available. You're willing to work? Or are you willing just to watch people do the work? Hmm? The church cannot do without willing people. Willing people. Faithful people. Willing people. The church cannot do, number three, without people of vision. People of vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Go back to Philippians, would you please? The book of Philippians and Paul shares us here in Philippians chapter 2 the vision that he gives to them. The vision that all of us ought to have in Philippians chapter 2. Notice what he says in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Boy, like-minded, same love, one accord, one mind. How in the world can that happen? Well, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Well, how does that happen? 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How does that happen? Here's how it happens. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the vision he cast before them, and it's a vision of Jesus Christ. A vision of who Jesus is. That's how, when, when you see Jesus, and we said this morning, we're conformed to the image of His Son. We're being conformed to who Christ is. And we're allowing Him to live through us. We have the same mind. We can be like-minded. We have the same goals set before us. We have the same purposes that we're striving for. We're striving together for the faith of the Gospel. And I want to see things as Jesus sees things. I want to walk as Jesus would walk. I want to think as Jesus would think. I want to love as Jesus would love. You have a vision of living like Jesus Christ. That's the vision of the church. We need to also see a vision of the people around us. There's unsaved people everywhere. I never, I never see a crowd watching the game last night and seeing that big white out at Penn State. 110,000 people. But I never see a crowd like that without wondering how many of those folks are saved. How many of those folks, if they die, they go to heaven? Anytime there's a crowd you, you, and you look, but listen, everybody we pass, there's people that are without Christ. Many of them could be brought in if we just went after them. If, if when they walk by our house, we say, come to church. And guess what? She did. That lady they had on the front row with them this morning, she was walking by. But she had no idea. You know, in the Moody Church in Chicago, in the days when R.A. Torrey was the pastor there and D.L. Moody before him, they used to, that, that had a nickname in Chicago. It was called the Soul Trap. Have you ever been in the old Moody Church? It's a, it's a big, it's a building and the, the seats go up and as you're, as you're there, there, it's like a theater style. It's, it's sections of, of seats. And in every section, they had a captain of that section. And their responsibility was that no visitor would come into their section and leave the service without the gospel being given to them. That's why it became known as the soul trap. And there were people in Chicago that went to other churches, but when they had lost loved ones visit them, they took them to Moody Church. Why? They said they'll get the gospel there. They know that someone will witness to them there. What a great testimony to have. I ought to have a testimony that, hey, that's a church where you'll get the gospel and you'll get saved. Someone will make sure that you won't walk in the door without somebody asking you, do you know if you died today you'd go to heaven? Are you sure that you have eternal life? The church has to have a vision. The gospel to people. A church that have a vision of promoting faith and not fear. You see, a godly vision always motivates you to action. A godly vision will always require some risk-taking. A godly vision will always bring glory to God and not to people. Vision about the needs around us. That's why there's and are you inside? That's why there's a radio broadcast. That's why there's a nursing home ministry. 30 at the nursing home today. That's why people need 
Jesus Christ. People need the gospel. We have to have the vision to reach them. So we need faithful people. We need willing people. We need people that have a vision. We also need, now get ready, the church needs liberal people. <gasps> now wait. Philippians chapter 4. Would you look there please? Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you are also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Skip down with me to verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to who? God. Now notice, nobody, can, nobody communicated with me concerning giving and receiving but you. In Thessalonica, verse 16, you sent once and again to my need. In 18, I received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Then you have verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you understand the context of where that promise is given? If you don't ever give to missions and you don't ever give liberally to the Lord's work, if you don't give sacrificially to the Lord's work, verse 19 isn't your promise. That's to a church that sent once and again to Paul's need. That willingly and sacrificially gave to missions. They were liberal in their giving. They were generous in their giving. We're conservative when it comes to the Word of God. We take it literally for what it says. Unless there's an indication in the passage it says we should take it not literal. But we believe in the fundamental, foundational truths of the Word of God. That's why we're independent, fundamental Baptists. We believe the Word of God teaches... The tithe is the Lord's. Belongs to Him. God never rescinded that. And yet I understand. Somebody says, well, that's the law. Well, let me remind you that under grace, grace always exceeded the law. So if, if you want to tithe or you want to give and you want to give less than 10%, then you're robbing God. Because grace always did more. Uh, God, when Jesus established grace, He rose the standard. He didn't lower it. Well, God loves a cheerful giver. We ought to give cheerfully, liberally to the work of God. Understand that someone who put a dollar in the plate tonight may be a liberal giver and one that put a hundred dollars in may not be. It depends on what percentage of your income that was. You understand, God set it up in His economy. It would be the same across the board. And by the way, the world works that way. Somebody says, well, preacher, I don't make that much money. God doesn't expect me to give 10%. Try that next time you need to buy tires for your car. Go to the tire shop and say, well, you know, my income's a little limited. you got a special for me, don't you? I don't pay as much as this guy over here. He looks like he's got a lot of money. He's driving a BMW. No. Tires are the same price no matter what your income is. Hmm? You understand? Jesus says He measures our generosity not by what we give, but by what's left over after we've given. Someone said this, 
It's not a sin to be rich, but it's a sin to die rich. Say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, do your giving while you're living. Say, well, wait a minute now, I got half a million in the bank. And if Jesus comes tonight, who gets all that? I guess the Antichrist will take it. Don't you think, if all the Christians disappeared out of the world, who do you think is going to get the money that's in the bank accounts? The government's going to take it. When a millionaire gives $50,000, we say, wow, what a liberal giver. But he still has $950,000 left over. He's not going to suffer financially. But when a man gives $20 out of the $100 he made that week, he's a liberal giver. He's giving sacrificially for the work of God. Isn't that what Jesus was saying when He sat by the treasury with His disciples? They were watching men give into the treasury. They didn't pass a plate like we do. Men walked up and put their money in. Some men come by and dropped in some rather large gifts. Probably in some cases so people could see what they gave. Maybe they said, wow, did you see how much Abraham put in? Wow. That guy's got some bucks. That's in the original language. You've got to dig deep to get that. He must love the Lord very much. And they watch this little widow woman come up and they hear the clanging of the coins as they fall into the pot. Nobody said anything about her gift. So Jesus spoke up. said, hey fellas, you see that woman and what she gave, she's, she gave more than all of those guys. Can you imagine the disciples? I'm sure they'd look at each other and say, what's he talking about? Man, we saw the wad of bills Abraham dropped in there. Jesus said, hey, those guys put large amounts in, but it was out of their abundance they gave. She gave Everything she had. She put everything in and trusted God to take care of her needs. You, when you love the Lord and you give out of love to Him, you never have to worry about outgiving God. I didn't, I didn't just hop on the cart a couple weeks ago. I've been on the salvation train for a few years. Been giving faithfully since I was 16 years of age or 15 years of age. I had a job. And I'll testify to you, you won't outgive God. And some of you in this room would say the same thing. You've seen God take care of you. The, the, the church, listen, the church's job isn't, listen, they say, oh, what our church needs, we need to get some, just get some wealthy people. No, 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 no. God says all the church needs is obedient people. And they'll give liberally. They love the Lord and you'll give. The church can get along without rich people. Can't get along without liberal people. Liberal in our giving. And I thank God for the liberal giving that God has given us here at Bible Baptist Church. God deserves that, by the way. He deserves it. He deserves a building that we... Listen, this is His building. It is, this is a sanctified place. Why? Because it's set apart for the work of God. Since 1957, when they built that small building down there, and 1970, when they built this one, and 1993, when they put up that fellowship hall, these buildings were dedicated to God. And so they need, to, they need to be kept up. And, and while, the, while, the, <laughs> while the water of life is free, the plumbing costs some money. It's got the, hey, the, the electric bill. 
Okay? We just got it in the mail on Saturday for the last month. $1,300 to pay the church electric. Okay? Cost money. And then the older building and the upkeep and things need painted and uh, 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 the electronic little thing needs fixed. <laughs> Air conditioners and, and furnaces and things like that need attention. But if anybody deserves to be treated first class, it's God. He deserves our best. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. When you love, you can give without loving, but you won't love without giving. It's impossible. The church needs liberal people. Need faithful people, willing people, people of vision, liberal people people and then let me say this number whatever number this is five the church can't do without its promoters look at Philippians 4 therefore my beloved or my brethren my dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown so stand fast in the Lord my dearly beloved I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I never read that verse, but years ago, Brother Gerard, I was reading Harry Ironside, and he called these two women odious and soon touchy. <laughs> and I never forgot that. This is the biggest problem they had in the church. Two women were fussing with each other. That's all. It's the only problem Philippi had. And he tells them that, 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 that you be of the same mind in the Lord. <clears throat> and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are written, or whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Talking about people who, who will realize what God is doing in their church and will go out and tell other people about it. Those of you in business, you tell me, what's the best form of advertising? Word of mouth. Not radio, and not television, and not internet. It's someone else telling someone else, that's the guy. That's the one to use. That's the one to go to. Telling others to, that what, a, what a great church service you just had. Hey, it's, a, it's promoting it when you walk into, church, walk into your work on Monday morning. You don't drag in like everybody else. Everybody dragging in. Uh, it's Monday. And here comes the Christian. Uh, it's Monday. Where's my coffee? Huh? How about walking into church and uh, saved by His power divine, saved. Boy, they'll look at you and say, man, what's going on with you? Hey, we had a great day in church yesterday. Man, it was incredible. When I get tea on Sunday over at Speedway and they say, have a good day, I said, I bet mine will be better than yours. <laughs> I do. It says, I'm going to have a better day where I'm going than where you are. Yeah. Well, I'd rather be in church than at Speedway. The sign on the church door said, come in without knocking and go out the same way. <clears throat> Remember, if you, if you knock the church, you're knocking yourself because the church is us. It's people. So promote it. You know what you do when you give out a gospel track and you invite somebody to church? You're promoting your church. I think, I think we got a group of people that think, hey, we got a great church. God's doing wonderful things. Who have you told about it to lately? Who have you shared that with lately? Put that on your social media. See how that works. Promote it. Years ago, I heard Tom Wallace preach a message. And it was about a country church, a sign out in the country that he saw. 
And it was, I mean, it just out in the middle of nowhere, and, and all of a sudden there was a church there, and there was a sign there, and, and it said, there is no other place just like this place, anywhere near this place, this must be the place. Huh? There is no other place just like this place, anywhere near this place, this must be the place. That's how you ought to feel about your church. There is another place anywhere near this place. It's just like this place. This must be the place. And it is the place. I like that. Let me give you the last one. The last person we cannot do without. And that's God. That's God. We can have all the other people, but if you don't have God, we don't have anything. We're not, we're not just a bunch of people to gather together and say we're a nice social club. If you want that, go down and join the Rotary. Or join the moose or the elk or the camels or whatever else it is. I don't know. We have to have God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God has to be present. But God's promise that whenever we gather together, in His name, there He'll be in the midst. It was great last Sunday night. Where's Lisa? Lisa's down here. When Lisa came last week and she goes, she had talked to me during the missions conference and said, I want to talk to you about getting baptized. She'd been saved, not been baptized since she was saved. I said, we'll talk about that. And then the last Sunday, I said, we're going to talk about baptism. And she came and she goes, well, how about if I just get baptized tonight? And I said, sure, that's fine. She said, I, absolutely. She goes, you know, because people aren't here, they'll just miss it. Yeah. People say, guess what happened? Yeah. Lisa got baptized. You know, people say, oh man, I missed it. I should have been there. You ever, you ever been in a great church service? I mean, and God met with you or decisions were made or someone got saved or someone got called to preach or called to the ministry and man, it was just exciting. It was wonderful. And you try to go tell somebody who wasn't here. And you're excited and you're telling them how great it was and they look at you. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, boy, that's exciting. They don't get it. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for live stream. I'm thankful that folks who can't get the service can see it. But it's not the same as being in church. It's not the same. There's way, how many understand? How many watch, try to watch live stream before and realize there's too many distractions to take your mind off the service? Huh? Yeah, there is. Jesus said that upon this rock I'll build my church. Without me, ye can do nothing. You can't replace the presence and the power of God. No, no band or multimedia or drama or coffee tables or PowerPoint presentations. Seems like everybody has to come up with all these things. You know why? Because God isn't there. And so you got to Work something up. Nothing can replace His power and His presence. Now the question tonight is simply this. Are you faithful? Are you willing? Do you have a vision for your church? Are you liberal? Are you a promoter? If you are, and the church can't do without you. We gotta have you. And you know what? We gotta have more of you. We gotta have more of you. In fact, we can't have too many like you. But we can't do anything without God. He's the one who empowers us, He's the one who energizes us, He's the one who strengthens us, He's the one who supplies for us, He's the one who guides us, He's the one who blesses us. He's the one who protects us. He's the one who enables us. He's the one who fills us. He's the one who uses us. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. Just, it, wouldn't, isn't it great 
to be part of something that's bigger than... Who would think that out of this group of people right here, that there'd be 70 missionaries around the world preaching the gospel? Who would think out of this group right here, there's, there's a fellow over in Uganda right now preaching the gospel. They've seen... I, I'm not exaggerating. I'm pretty sure they've seen hundreds saved. Brother Yoder and Brother Riley. And trips next year with 1040 going to, to India and the Philippines and, and probably back to Uganda and, and I don't know where all else. That's, that's, people look and say, out of, out of that, that church? From these people? We had, I don't know what we had Wednesday night. I don't even remember. You remember what we had for attendance, Bob? I don't remember. 90, something like that on Wednesday night. But we just on the spur of the minute like that said, let's take an offering for Brother Kevin. Be a blessing to him. Get him, get him established. Get him, get him some things he needs. And we're just a few dollars shy of $300 that came in Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. Now you love him because you don't know him yet. But... I'm teasing you, Kevin. But that, see, that, that shows your heart for people. That's what, that's what we're looking for. That's what God's looking for. You have that kind of heart, the, 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 the way you treated the missionaries and the way you were a blessing to them. That's what God's looking for. Let's be that kind of church. When I say the kind of people the church can't do without, that's kind of a, an oxymoron because the church is the people. That's us. But we all have to be these things and we all have to seek God and ask Him to work in us and work through us so we can do the work that God wants us to do in the way He wants it to be done. Amen? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You, Lord, for our church. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, things that sometimes we're not even aware of. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as your people to tell you tonight we'll be faithful people. We'll be willing people. We'll be people of vision. We'll be liberal people. That God, we want you to use us to accomplish your will in our generation. As it was said of David, he served his own generation by the will of God. May we serve our generation by the will of God. Increase those kind of people for our church. Keep us loving and serving you. 